This afternoon I'm talking to Nicola Fleur, who is an artist living in Wales, and we're going to show some of Nicola's artwork and then discuss the process by which she got into it. But in fairness to Nicola, because she asked, I haven't shown her any of my artwork and she showed me hers, I'm going to show her one painting. This is a self-portrait. I did this painting from a photograph that I had of myself. And what I find is that when I paint anything, it comes from my unconscious, right? And so even though I did draw out some of the uh, outlines of my face here with a pencil, after that I simply used a palette knife and nothing else, no uh, brushes whatsoever. And I just threw paint onto the medium, which is poster board. Uh, or not, it's not poster board, it's like quarter inch thick stuff, I don't know what you call it. So I just threw paint on it and I had two photographs. This is me on uh, September the 6th, 1970. I have a photograph of myself before this operation. I was a U.S. Marine and so I have a photograph of myself, a before photograph, which shows me cocky and looking like you might think of a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps, a very cocky young man. And this is three days later. And I was going to paint both, so I had a point before and after picture. But I decided to do the after picture first, and once I completed it, I, I took one look at it and I said, I can't paint the other one because this one says everything that I have to say about the Vietnam War. Absolutely everything. I'm, I don't talk about my experiences in the Vietnam War because I think that this painting really sums it up. And can you guess what part of the painting? There's, there's one small area of this painting that sums up everything that I have to say. Can you guess where that is in this painting? Well, I can, I can see a star above your head. It's sort of a star. Uh, well, uh, you see a star on my head? Well, it's like an orange streak just above your head. It looks like a star to me. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I never noticed that before, but yes, you're right. <laughs> it, it's actually the foliage behind me, but... Uh, yeah, it's not fire. Huh? Yeah. It's very fiery. Yeah, that's interesting. That's very interesting. I had never noticed that. It's good that I asked you, because yeah. now, now I'm seeing other imagery in that foliage behind me, which I hadn't really focused on before but you're quite right and there's uh, a lot of shock in the face as well it just looks very shocked right and what i say is it's the white of my left eye is ah. is the sort of the essence of this painting and uh, for me anyway because i i lived this experience it just summed it up to me and as I said, I, I had rough outlines of where my shoulders would be, where my chin would be, where the helmet would be. And then after that, I just whipped the paint on the paper. And this is what I came up with. And after I looked at this painting when it was done, I said, man, I can't do the other painting. And what I found, you're probably familiar with the story of the portrait of Dorian Gray, I suppose. Vaguely. Okay, well basically that story is about a painting that keeps changing during a man's life and it actually represents his shadow. And he puts the painting up in his attic because he doesn't want to see, he doesn't want people to see what he really thinks, right? And 
I sort of, in a sense, as a portrait artist, I sort of had that experience because uh, I had a, I joined a portrait co-op at one point. When I joined this portrait co-op, the way they worked was they, a model would come in five different times for three hours each. So members of the portrait co-op would have the opportunity to paint them for 15 hours total to make a portrait. And it so happened that the week that I started this happened to be the fifth time for one person and she happened to be the head of Maryland Hall for the uh, Creative Arts and so um, she was sitting there posing for this portrait and in about an hour or so I just slapped paint on the canvas and you know I wasn't thinking too much about it I wasn't thinking that I would get anything out of it and when I was finished that was it except it, it had largely green in it and so I said wow that really looks like the Grinch who stole Christmas <laughs> I'm embarrassed by it but because this woman was the the head of the center uh, she bought all the portraits and there were like 30 of them so she it was very kind of her to do that she took it away and about two years later I realized that she had hung it in a place of honor in her office and I said you know why are you hanging my portrait up it's absolutely the worst one that was done of you and she said you know I like yours the best because it expresses exactly how I was feeling that day and so it was my unconscious communicating directly from her unconscious to mine and then directly onto the canvas and so, you know, I'm very sensitive about these things now. <laughs> and I'll give you a sense of some of the other things that I've done here. here. Here's one, which I call Knowing the Shadow, if I can get it up. So I did a bunch of paintings on sort of this motif. You know, I'll just leave it. <laughs> at that <laughs> okay <laughs> but the the plate is a symbol of the self in Jungian psychology and the shadow uh, this is called knowing the shadow and the, the the male model in this is a black man and the and a white woman of course and she's wearing kind of a, a slave collar there on her neck the shadows coming from behind then yes I call this one the, the high priestess so this is my version of the high priestess from the tarot so half is in darkness yeah and the, all all of those paintings for that show were black and white they were definitely from my shadow side let's put it that way I've yeah. always appreciated artistic skill that can create form because for me I've never been able to create form I've you, got that kind of skill you haven't been able to create form you say yeah as in portraits landscapes all I can do is abstract I, I just find uh, form unobtainable so I really value it in other artists I see well I, I mean that's perfectly fine of course that's just the art artwork that supports you so here's one more but I stopped painting because I said okay well this is all bringing my shadow up <laughs> and so I had about 35 or 40 paintings in this show that I did on April the 9th 2005 it was interesting because I thought that fundamentalist Christians might picket my show because I had advertised it at a local pub and so I thought people might picket but they didn't no nobody did and they came to the show and within five or ten minutes uh, this mood of euphoria came up in the room which was very unexpected and now I understand it better 
uh, from my study of Jung's work that what I was doing was releasing everybody's shadow so that everybody was looking at it and saying, wow, this is pretty interesting. And then everybody's shadow got cooked and there was euphoria in the room. Yeah. Is this one Dracula then? Pardon? Is this one Dracula? No, I call this one Surrender. And so here she's surrendering to her shadow. Most people are not comfortable around the shadow. Yeah, but I don't think they really knew that it was the shadow. <laughs> you know, even even I was, even though I had studied Jungian psychology for a long while and knew a lot about it at that point, after that and about that time, I got very in, interested in abstract art because I went to the Boston Museum of Art one time and I came upon a Jackson Pollock drip painting which I hadn't expected and you know art doesn't usually move me that much when I go through a museum I mean I know there are people who go through a museum and are moved to tears constantly that rarely or almost never happens with me but on that particular day I came upon a, a, a real Jackson Pollock not a photograph of it and I began to sob and I didn't know why and it took me uh, 20 years to know and it happened uh, when I was running one of my young meeting groups, reading group sessions, that I described this painting and one of my uh, members who's, who is an artist uh, just said olive drab and boom I got this connection to this piece of artwork and it, it again caused me to sob and I knew that my connection was correct which was that it connected me up with the death of a, a very good friend of mine in Vietnam. But that was completely unconscious for 20 years. I, I knew I had had the experience in the Boston Mu Museum of Art, but I didn't know why I had had it. And that's a lot about me, but we were going to talk about you. So, <laughs> are, are you stunned, shocked, or what about my art, just out of curiosity? Yeah, I can see there's a lot of um passion and a lot of emotion, especially in the first one. Right. A lot of shadow. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in the in the art show, there was lots of shadow, no doubt about it. And so I think I have all of your paintings up on my screen at the moment. So would you just tell me the name of one you want to talk about and we'll pull we'll pull that up and share it. Uh, elemental. Okay, so this is your painting called Elemental. And so tell me about this painting, Nicole. Uh, I did this. This is the very first painting I did, uh, which was about 11 years ago. Um, and it was triggered by um, a painful, uh, emotional crisis to do with the relationship breakdown. And um, it just got me questioning. Uh, why I'm feeling these emotions or, you know, things like jealousy and anger. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to project onto another person. So I decided to paint my way through it. And this is sort of my way of trying to face my shadow and all the elements coming together, the earth, air, fire, water, and trying to fit them all together Mm -hmm. And because it was such a state of turmoil at the time, I was trying to sort of please, instead of trying to please another person, I was trying to own those emotions. And the only way I could do that was through painting. And this is what propelled it. Um, and at the time, were you familiar with the fact that uh, the, those four elements are used in alchemy? Only vaguely. I, I had a vague uh, interest in spirituality, uh, mm -hmm. so I was interested in earth, air, fire and water. I'd read bits about them and um, I just wanted to bring them all together to work through my inner turmoil. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because it was just a raw ongoing pain yes but it, i i was familiar with it because i did um have an interest in spirituality at the time yeah mm -hmm. and um uh well, obviously, in our psyches, uh, there are not, I mean, everything is mixed in there. <laughs> and so, in a sense, abstract, ab abstract paintings are really a, an expression of that fact, as opposed to a painting of a photograph, for example, which is what I had done, or I tended to be more pedantic about making a picture picture and uh, I never really just let it let it all hang out in in this way ex except in the sense of doing a portrait of someone you know I would be referring to something that was, was form as opposed to feeling directly and that's yeah. partially because I'm a T but <laughs> I'm a um, I'm, uh, I think my profile is at INF Slash T. INFT? Yeah, I, I'm a INFP, but it also says slash T, so I think I'm both. Yeah, so you could be near the center, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. And, um, okay, so, and then what happened? What, what was your feeling after you had done this? Um, a little bit of relief. Mm -hmm. It was nice to see it on paper, on canvas. Um, I just was trying to understand the different energy dynamics going on in relationships. And I, I, logos didn't do it for me. Image has always been my main thing. Uh -huh. And this was my way of understanding relationship energy dynamics. I see. So I, I didn't feel relief after it, but it, it took about a good year to, to overcome. I had to carry on and on. It, it was an ongoing after the painting there wasn't complete release it was just a little bit of release and then and, and, and how how long did you spend on the painting oh not long at all no time at all i i, I didn't consciously paint this mm -hmm. um something came through i think artists the best artists are those that uh paint from the unconscious mm. uh, and and let it flow out from the unconscious and and that's where some artists get in trouble because they can't they find the inability to get back to that place where they can where they can let it flow yeah now, now i think i understand at least what i need to do to get that flow going again if i want to do and you know, these days, my way of doing it is through this, through communication uh, this way, yeah. uh, and and by sharing my video. But is this painting still for sale or not for sale? No, I don't know what happened to it. When I was moving house, I think I accidentally got rid of it. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> well, I, might, I might have accidentally on purpose. I God, see. Because I wanted it at my life. I don't know. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's understandable. You know, you just... fed up of it and just give it to someone. <laughs> let, it, let that energy be on that person. <laughs> you, you've never practiced witchcraft, right? <laughs> so what's the next painting? Let's talk uh, about variety. it. Variety. All right, so tell me about that one. Yeah, this was done not long after the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and doing this one, I started to feel that the diversity of me was coming together and accepting all the aspects in myself. It was like, it was still a troubling time, but I was starting to expose my colors again. And after keeping myself, you know, under a shell for so long, I was starting to come out of my shell. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just starting to integrate more and starting to feel that uh, I could express myself Okay, great. You still have that one, or? <laughs> yes, I still have that one, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think that was the first one I had in an exhibition, actually. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Tell me what the next one we should look at is. Uh, firecracker. Okay, Firecracker, that one I have right here. Okay, there you go.
yeah, this was about uh, a year. I've been painting for about a year now when this was like my fire has now been roaring for a whole year. And this is where I started to rise and take ownership of my emotions, it felt. Mm -hmm, so I mm -hmm. was just all the rage I was feeling, all the uh, things I'd suppressed for so long was just now starting to come out on the surface. Mm -hmm. and I was starting to feel, even though it was excruciating and very painful, um, it was my only way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that's just a, a, a vision of it, I suppose. Okay, so, so this wasn't a, a new uh, love interest or anything like that. I mean, there's a lot of passion going on there. Sure, sure. Um, but it was a lot of um, a lot of suppressed light, a lot of suppressed spark and rage within myself. I think finally being acknowledged within my consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that was the second painting I had. Depicted. Well, we we all go through those periods of rage, and it's obviously better if we somehow express them out. Mm. Um, and uh, okay, instead of projecting them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. To project it onto somebody else, but right. I, I think a lot of people do a, do try to project them on someone else, and that's not very healthy no. uh, for society at all. So let's pick another one now. Uh, the one after that was called Totality. Okay, so here's Totality. And yeah, um, this was originally called Circus, this one, um, and, which is a bit synchronistic, really, because um, this was the third exhibition it was in. Uh -huh. and, um, the person who launched the exhibition was a Welsh uh, actor called uh, Matt Fraser. Uh -huh. And he went on to star in a TV show, American Horror Story uh, Freak Show, which is about a traveling circus. Hmm. Uh, a very good show about the shadow so i highly recommend that but i uh -huh. decided to change the name to totality um and this one just feels like a confused mess to me because it was um it's done at a similar time to firecracker although uh something is trying to form in the center mm -hmm. it's like everything wants to be expressed all at once and on the surface it's like as a person i'm quiet on the surface and still but you yeah. know like a raging volcanic eruption waiting to explode. <laughs> it's like everything wanting to happen all at once. Yes. And then right. something silvery in the in the center is trying to form there. Uh -huh. But it's all completely unconscious. I you know, I don't know how that the, those colours come together. It's just completely unconscious. Yeah. And, and so you said this is your third show that you Yeah, that was the third. Uh -huh. But I found it really difficult to turn up to those exhibitions, especially this one. I just went completely mute and introverted. I couldn't speak to anyone because I just felt really exposed. You, you, you said you couldn't speak with anyone at the show or? Yeah, I just went mute, completely mute. Uh -huh. I just felt really exposed. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand that. I, I invited all the Jungian analysts in the Washington area to my show, <laughs> the one I was showing you a few samples from, and I have this terrific picture of me with uh, Jean Shinoda Bolin, who's famous for uh, goddesses in every woman and gods in every man. I did a second show in Greenwich Village, believe it or not, I had Miss Universe attend it, complete with sash. <laughs> Moving on, tell me another of your paintings and I'll pull that up. Uh, duality. Okay, so this is your painting, Duality. Yeah, um, this was um, not long after Totality, I think. Um, I'd been on the non-dual path for quite a few years by then and um, was questioning the split of duality, trying to understand how fire and water meet, mm -hmm. how opposites collide, and how, how to integrate both without getting lost in the limbo of oneness. Right. Uh, part of my individu individuation process um, now is coming away from non-duality. Um, I think you can get lost in it. Yeah. Um, and I think it can be just as 
dogmatic and you can be judged for developing your ego. Yeah. You, you really need to keep duality going, but you need to rise above it. Yeah. In, in a way. Uh, and um, and so how, how would you describe your in, individuation process? As, as it was going forward. At what point did you realize you were doing an in individuation process? Oh, oh, not until, um, <coughs> not consciously, until fairly recently, the last couple of years. Uh -huh. Two or three years, maybe. I yeah. wasn't conscious of it at the time I was painting at all. Okay, so when you paint, and did you call it duality at the time? Or? I did, yeah. Uh, because I was into non-duality, uh, <clears throat> and I, I wanted to merge into the oneness. Right. So you time. wanted a conjunctio. Yeah, there was. It was just wanting to merge and. Right. Okay. It's only uh, now looking back I can understand. And what were you? Were you trying to express emotions at this time or not? Uh, I I was trying to create form, I think, as well. I, it's sort of water and fire. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to create form, and I, I just felt like a failure. I, I felt like I, I couldn't succeed at creating form, so all that came out was this. Colors <laughs> together. Right. I always felt like a failure. Oh, well, it, I mean, a lot of these are very lovely paintings, uh, very interesting, and it, it just depends whether they move someone or not. I mean, what I, what I find with paintings uh, uh, is that they either move me or they don't. I, I like images uh, very much. Let's talk about another one. Volcano. Volcano. There it is. Yeah, this was me trying to find my place in the world, and yeah, I felt continually misunderstood as an abstract artist. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that abstract art can only be understood by those who have consciously faced their shadows and allowed themselves to be overtaken by the unconscious. Mm -hmm. so not many people understand this kind of art at all. Well, that's right, and certainly C.G. Jung didn't understand it at least not at first I think later on he he got it and he was are you, are you familiar with the paintings in the red book only some of them right you know he was quite an accomplished painter but He never thought of himself as an artist. He wanted to be a scientist. So the artist was his shadow side. But the artist definitely came through. He used the art as a way to get through to his unconscious so that he could uh, work with it and use the energies that came forward. Let me grab my red book so I can give you a sense of it here. Here's one that, that I love. And so in this you can see the mandala up high and you see the tree and the roots of the tree and beneath the tree there there's a dragon lots of other things obviously a star and a mandala in the sky and so on creepy crawly creatures and underneath which is referring to the unconscious and then here's one of his paintings very late in life where he was just drawing doodles of individual faces. This one with the fellow with the wings, that's Philemon and that's his god image. I forget what the story on this other one is here, but it's a woman that's dressed more or less an Arab dress for a woman. Uh, she's got many people around her uh, sort of going, Hosanna, 
Except maybe it's not a woman. It's very androgynous. Beautiful. If you just go and Google, put in Carl Jung Red Book images, you can get a whole bunch of them. Yes, yeah, so I There are yeah. people that are selling Gicle versions of them, just to give you a sense of his work. So he obviously was working artistically, bringing things up from the unconscious for many years. And he was pretty accomplished at it, but he didn't go entirely over to the abstract side, mm -hmm. other than some of the work he did with, uh, you know, shapes and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, okay, so we're talking about Volcano here. So tell me about Volcano now. Yeah, this was just about feeling misunderstood uh, as an abstract artist. And um, again, trying to create form and nothing <laughs> emerging. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just the shadow being exposed and uh, it being uh, unaccepted and misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Was anything particular going on in your life at that time or? But you were, um, you were feeling this misunderstanding coming, urging its way up on you, is that the... Yeah, just, just emotions wanting to explode and wanting to be understood. Mm -hmm. Just a, lo a lot of uh, passion and um, depressed emotions. And uh, when you do paintings like this, do you become emotional? Do you find yourself sobbing or anything like that? Nope. You don't. It just happens. It's uh -huh. like I'm not there. It, it, I'm sorry, it's like cutting off what? It's like I'm not there. Oh, it's like you're not there, I see. Yeah. Okay. So well, let's talk about another one. Uh, black hole is next. Okay, black hole is right here. So let's bring that one up. Here's black hole. Yeah, this is one of my favorites uh, for reasons I can't really put into words, but I like the black streak across the center. Uh -huh. I, I like the dripping and the merging of the colors because it, it just reminds me like of a new galaxy emerging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like a black hole being pulled into it. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Some of these uh, remind me a bit of uh, Vincent Kennedy's work. Do I I yeah, that was. I love his artwork. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? But this is this is very nice, and obviously, it can be attractive to people. Are Are you still having regular art shows, or how are you? No, um, I've had a very dry bout. Um, I'm in a drought at the moment. Uh -huh. uh, well, pa painted wise, but uh, I'm very creative now with the words. I'm more into the poetry side. Mm hmm. Uh, so I'm developing other parts of my creativity. Yeah, great. I've been there too, so I I know the feeling. <laughs> I mean, I did those. I did three art shows in 2005 with the work that you saw, and then I haven't touched a brush since then. Believe it or not, but I've been doing other things that have exercised my creativity. So, yeah. um, so now I'm doing it in the form of interacting with people to draw them out and to do this YouTube channel that I consider is a creative act too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's uh, many ways to channel it, yeah. Yep. So anyway, shall we talk, talk about another one here? Uh, the one after that was Matrix. Okay, so there's Matrix. Yeah, this one is the biggest one I've ever done. It's, I think it's about three foot by three foot. Uh -huh. uh, and this was me consciously being angry, I think, at trying to find form. Uh, and again, it, it does remind me of something up in the outer space, just all the colors. Did you happen to see the movie Matrix at about this time, by any chance? Uh, I've seen it years before this uh -huh. painting, but I, I, like, I don't know, the word Matrix just came into my mind to title it. Okay, because some of these 
some of these names uh, do come from Dr. Young's work, as you no doubt know. I mean, obviously, uh, duality comes from originally probably from Buddhism <laughs> or Hinduism, I don't know which, but you know, he was always talking about the opposites. The word duality may have come from Hinduism or Buddhism. I'm not sure which started to talk about it first, but obviously the opposites are very important in Jungian analysis and basically the idea of, of psychic energy uh, comes between the opposites. So we have many opposites in our psyche, thousands of them probably. The most obvious ones are masculine and feminine and so on, but, but the energy to keep going one way or another comes comes from that those opposites. But the ideal is to be able to rise your psyche above the opposite so you can watch them going zit 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 back and forth but but you're not in the middle of it which is very painful very often. Yeah. Uh, this image sort of reminds me of that. The psychic energy is is forcing its way back and forth across the uh, canvas. I can, I can see all the energy pushing back and forth and you know it's it's not that any anything is good or bad per se but it's that you have opposites and if you can if you if you know there's a matrix <laughs> and you can put it on your wall <laughs> as as you have it there uh, then you can maybe detach yourself from the matrix and just watch the game going on but be above yeah. it and that would be a higher plane of spirituality i think okay I like that one. I that's a, that's a very interesting one. So what's next? A uh, supernova. Supernova. Okay, there it is. Yeah, this is uh, another favorite of mine. Um, this was done very quickly, um, and it just feels like this was me saying over. And I, I remember having to tilt the canvas many times and using a lot of water to get the dripping effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just felt like uh, I was becoming more empowered within myself. Uh -huh. So you I just felt like I was consciously more engaged with it. Good for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. I do like that one too. <laughs> I, I can't say, I mean, I like many of them now. I, since I've come to appreciate abstract art, I, I really like them. It used to be that I couldn't connect with them, but yeah. since, since my experience with the Pollock, I uh, have rather liked it. Okay, what else? Uh, Milky Way. Okay. Yeah, this was done after Supernova, quite a while after, because I had a was uh, this was done after supernova quite a while after because i had a bit of a drought but this is me trying to get a grip on form mm -hmm. uh, i think there's a lot of frustration involved because i was trying to get into the painting again now when you say form what what is it that you're driving at can you express that well uh, landscapes portraits just objects in reality uh -huh. I, I just cannot get a grip on you know i can't create form all and all that comes out is just all these mess to me it's just <laughs> mess. <laughs> which does express feeling obviously and and yes. and each person I mean I you know when when you see a painting like this human beings tend to anthropomorphize so they tend to see a form of a of a body or in this case I would say a magenta angel flying above the earth uh, raining down grace or something <laughs> and maybe down in, in the lower corner left corner here are some people looking up at her watching what she's doing but I know that abstract art isn't intended to be watched that way but that's what comes to my mind so I think you're starting to get some form here. Yeah. Um, 
it depends on the individual's perspective, I suppose, doesn't it? A million. Yeah, million. very much so. I mean, it, it depends entirely on an individual. So, uh, you know, when as an artist, when you sell a piece of art, you have to let it go like you let go of a baby that you you'll never see again, and you don't know how that person who bought it reacted to yeah. it. I'm I'm just giving you the benefit of my my observation in this one um, but what did you see in this you just like it reminds me of a hand the big pink part reminds me of a hand trying to get a grip mm -hmm. on reality i see yeah yeah i definitely can see that an antiodromia okay an antiodromia my favorite word oh, that's my favorite word as well one of my favorite words. Okay. All right. So tell me about how you uh, learned about an anteodromia and how it, how it works in your life. Um, well, I'm fascinated with the word because um, I think, even though I'm an introverted, I think I can change into the opposite as well and become an extroverted. Mm -hmm. It's by something external. Um, but it's just fascinating that you can um, transform uh, unintentionally into an opposite. Mm -hmm. Just pure alchemy to me. You're, uh, but you're seeming much more extroverted than I I feel right now. I mean, you, you, you're you seeming very extroverted in this conversation more so than me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can go like that. I can turn. I, yeah. I got some sides to me. Right. So, an antiodromia is the word, I think, that came from Heraclitus, where he uh, said it's the tendency of things to turn into their opposites. Mm -hmm. And so, when you have a psychic opposite, if you get yourself way out on one end of the spectrum, the more, farther you go out on the spectrum, the more the energy is pulling you back toward the center. And once you start to slide back toward the center, you could go entirely the other way. This is uh, an interesting, interesting rendition of that. What was going on when you were painting this one? Uh, I think there was a lot of frustration here. Uh, there's a lot of thick layers of paint here, which I don't normally use. Because uh -huh. uh, I usually use water. But yeah, again, I was feeding a very drought period and unable to channel my unconscious. I, I felt like I was deliberately trying to paint something instead mm -hmm. of opposed to my, letting the unconscious work through me. Right. Uh, but it was, yeah, I felt very frustrated and was trying to merge emotion and light to bring it to the surface and trying to get an opposite side of me out mm -hmm. to the surface. And I was trying to do that in a conscious way, which um, I don't normally do. Uh -huh. Well, I think most of us don't normally do it, but it's very handy to know about it and to know about that possibility and the fact that you can get to the other direction if you need be. Uh, okay, it looks like I have two more, uh, Abyss and Alchemy. Oh, there was one called Starry Night before that. Oh, the Starry Night, yes, I definitely want to do that one because... Vincent van Gogh is one of my favorite artists of all time. It's partially because I, I read his autobiography. Okay, there it is. Yeah, there's, a, there's lots of movement here. And it's yes. just two different worlds, uh, like <laughs> starry night sky and rustling leaves or fire that mm -hmm. arise from Earth. It's like two worlds. Right. I, I like it too because it, it sort of gives a pointer back toward Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night, which has lots of movement in it as well, as you know, because mm -hmm. of all the swirling around the star. So that's very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, very beautiful. And you're in a, in a, what, a deserted field or something. Yeah. I've been there. I've, I've been to that place. Yeah. <laughs> we all have, I think. Very nice. Okay. What else? We have? Uh, alchemy was after that one. So there's alchemy. Mm -hmm. 
yeah this one felt very shamanic like a jaguar was trying to come through me it feels uh different to the rest of my painting but um it's just had a very dynamic energy and it, yeah. again it was just like form was trying to emerge and um it's like a relationship between consciousness and matter which mm -hmm. is what alchemy is just trying to show itself and I mean, transformation for me is my core, and I think this is just an yeah. expression of that. And th this is the spirit coming through. Mm. Yeah. And that's what the alchemists were about. So how did you, um, how did you relate to alchemy um, first? I mean, alchemy, well, go ahead. Well, the time of this painting, I, I didn't know what alchemy was when uh -huh. I all I knew as I was just dabbing colors on and spot, trying to, I was trying to do things a little bit differently for my usual style with the dots. Mm -hmm. It's like form is starting to come out a little bit more now in this one. Yes. But again, it was completely unconscious. Or how did you come up with the idea of using alchemy as the name for this painting? Uh, well, because I like the idea that um, of working with consciousness I like the relationship between consciousness and matter mm -hmm. and the transformation process involved right. that. yeah and of course the alchemists were looking to find the spirit in matter they wanted to their activity was to find the the spirit and by that they meant the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in, in matter and that's what they got going with basically with early chemistry and you can almost see it here where you know they were aware that uh, iron for example is magnetic and and so it either draws two pieces of iron together or it forces them apart whichever and they considered that the spirit of matter and I can almost I can almost see that spirit being expressed in this painting uh, that's interesting. One more is Abyss. Okay, so this is Abyss. Yeah, this is, this is one of the last paintings I did, which was about six years ago, and it coincided with me becoming exposed to Jungian thinking and um, getting involved in a dream group. Uh huh. Um, I started uh, about <clears throat> 2013, I think. I done a, a dream workshop with um, Coco Par Turner. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to get exposed more to young yin thinking, and um, but again, it was unconscious. Uh, I remember using an oak leaf in the center there for the orange part and painting around it, mm -hmm. but then letting the rest paint itself. Yeah, I just started off with the center with a leaf, and then just the rest just come out. Yeah, interesting. But I would like to make a living from art, but it's very difficult. Oh yeah, it's difficult. I mean, if, I would say to any aspiring artist that uh, you have to have a day job and then you can do art because yeah. art is your connection to your unconscious and it helps you have a happy life. You have to find a way to live aside from that, yeah. definitely. And then if you're lucky, your art will get people's attention while you're still alive, but most most of the famous art we see is art of dead artists, unfortunately. Yeah. What do you hope would happen from this interview now? I mean, I'm, I'll publish the interview on the website, but you know, if you had a dream about what could happen from this, what would that be? I just want to raise awareness of the shadow, really. Uh -huh. I want to become aware of their shadow and work with it consciously instead of ignoring it and suppressing it. Right. And to, to be willing to face your emotions, your raw emotions, and to feel them. Even though it's painful, I think it's more painful not to because they will show up as fate, as Young said, and they will enact in your reality in the form of severe drama and pain. Yes. You know, what is that when you can do it consciously? work right. with the unconscious consciously and that's I just want people to be aware of that and expose the shadow I think, that, 
I think that's very useful and help, helpful to people. Well, it's delightful to talk to you, Nicola. Are there other things that you'd like to talk with me about? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, uh, I just want people to be aware of their shadow and, you know, just to work with it and engage with it. Well, because that's, yeah, that's very interesting. So I will, I will put that in somehow in the title. I think that's a, a worthwhile goal, definitely. Oh, I enjoyed chatting with you and seeing your art. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, I loved it. Pardon? I loved the discussion that we just had. Good. Yeah. I think conversation helps people. And if you can have, you know, especially if you're an introvert, as I am, uh, I know I have a hard time meeting people. and. My wife would beat up on me and say, you've got to get out. You've got to get some friends. And so, <laughs> and, and so then I started to do that, and then she gets a little jealous <laughs> that I do. <laughs> but she was right. And, you know, I, as an introvert, I tend to live in my head a lot. And uh, so having the opportunity to chat with someone like this is is great for me because it, it gets me out of this dark space that's in my unconscious and makes me see if I can interact with people in the world and make a contribution uh, to their lives even.